The yeas are 352. The nays are 65. TikTok just got banned? No. So basically, this is the end of Tickle Talk as we know it, unless they sell the company. This is what we are focused on in America today, TikTok. And the takes are coming in hot as creators and influencers react to the news from Capitol Hill as lawmakers are now one step closer to possibly banning TikTok. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. We start tonight with that very, very lopsided vote in Washington today. The left and the right joining forces to turbocharge a bill that could ban TikTok, but only if they don't ditch their Chinese parent company. Now, the final tally was not even close. 352 yeas and 65 nays. At a time when lawmakers rarely agree on anything, this brought out some very unlikely allies, like Georgia conservative Marjorie Taylor Greene and New York progressive Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, both congresswomen, in the minority together today, voting against the ban. And at one point, you could even see former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi literally walking across the aisle to talk about voting in favor of the bill with Texas Rep Chip Roy, who also joined with the yeas. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic-tac-toe, a winner. We are in a cold war with China, and some of my colleagues want to ignore this fact. We have legislation before us that is 12 pages long. The bill is not a ban. It forces foreign adversaries, including Chinese communists, to divest. President Biden will sign the bill into law if it passes the Senate, even though, yes, the Biden campaign has a TikTok account. NBC News is now reporting that the CEO of TikTok is planning to meet with lawmakers tomorrow, and all of this coming as a couple of days after the top U.S. intelligence officials spoke to lawmakers about national security threats, which included TikTok. Here's a, a brief exchange between Senator Marco Rubio and FBI Director Christopher Wray. If ByteDance in China is the one that owns the driver that makes TikTok effective. Isn't it true that under Chinese law, the Chinese Communist Party says that data that you're gaining access to in order to make your algorithm work, we want a copy of that data? That's my understanding. All right, NBC's Brian Chung joins us now. Brian, a lot of this is about the data that we were just hearing about. And then China's potential access to the data of something like 170 million Americans, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not the data collection because uh, all the social media companies really do that. It's the Chinese aspect of it that is the concern here. So what the lawmakers are proposing here is uh, getting this law out there, hopefully, uh, they hope at least, passed by the Senate and then the White House as well, to force TikTok's Chinese parent company, ByteDance, to divest the company within six months or face a full nationwide ban. Now, uh, again, TikTok is pointing to their 170 million users to argue that uh, this was would be uh, devastating for the many creators who, in some cases, also have a livelihood uh, built off of this app because they might sell things on the app. So uh, TikTok is doing a full court press here, and actually they were doing it in the lead up even to today's vote by notifying uh, TikTok users through the app and saying, hey, put in your zip code and then call your local representative to urge them to vote no. Clearly that didn't work on the House side, but you do wonder if that focus is now turning to the Senate, as you mentioned, with the CEO also headed to Capitol Hill. And, Brian, what's the biggest concern in Congress? Is it the data or is it the possibility that this crazy popular app is used to subtly push propaganda from a U.S. adversary? Well, it, it's both of those things, right? So when you talk about it, it it's the, the push and pull of, well, the Chinese government might be uh, taking data from uh, TikTok, which TikTok, by the way, vehemently denies. They say that they uh, operate entirely independently of ByteDance and that they don't give anything to the Chinese government. But then you also have the concerns that in an election year, TikTok could be used by the CCP to advance whatever agenda they want to advance to a very important young Gen Z uh voter base. And again, 170 million users in this country, that is an extremely significant amount of people that are using this app. Uh, we've heard from intelligence officials uh, who have testified to Congress and said that they are worried about uh, the Chinese government perhaps doing something like that. All these are kind of theoreticals. It has yet to be proven either of those things. On the TikTok side, there hasn't necessarily been proof yet that they haven't offered anything to the Chinese government. But then there also isn't any smoking gun quite yet of the Chinese government 
government using TikTok data that they've collected in the United States. So uh, that's why, though, maybe lawmakers are saying this is preemptive. They're trying to get ahead of those potential use cases. But again, you have to take a look at this through an election lens as well, given how important that election is this year. And Brian, if this goes through, I imagine this is definitely going to end up in court, right? Well, I mean, yes, but that wouldn't happen until after this gets passed into law with uh, President Biden's uh, signature, which, by the way, has indicated he would do. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, certainly legal action would be the next natural course for TikTok if this does become law. And that is exactly what TikTok did the last time they faced a divestiture. We have to remember, this is not the first time that they have faced some sort of government mandate to say, you need to sell TikTok. This happened in 2020 when then-President Donald Trump Sorry. signed an executive order to try to get them to do the same thing. And and uh, TikTok went to the courts. And if this ban does happen, what kind of effect would this have on, on the whole influencer creator economy? Well, it's already creating ripples. I, I've talked to creators who have said they're trying to hedge their bets by posting on YouTube or maybe on Instagram. But they say that TikTok is so different because of the potential for virality. Yes, Instagram is great for friends. But if you want to reach random people, TikTok's algorithm and the first for you page on that front is really what makes it so attractive for a lot of creators and also for a lot of small business owners as well. That's what TikTok is trying to capitalize on by trying to motivate them to call their local uh, congressional representative to say, please vote this down. But again, the odds of this happening are up again. And, you know, for those that have also been in Montana, where they face a statewide ban as well, this is not the first time they have seen this headline. So we'll have to see how all of this pans out. Uh, speaking of For You page, you have been popping up on my For You page <laughs> quite frequently. Your musings on all things economy from your couch, you. they are fire, bro. Thank we'll you see so for much how much for longer. We'll see for how much longer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. And for a little bit more on what could happen next, let's bring in CNBC's Brian Schwartz. Brian, okay, so let's just start with the most drastic case scenario here for those of us that already have TikTok on our phones. If this gets banned, somehow gets supercharged through the Senate, the president signs it, doesn't somehow get in front of a court to gum it up there, what happens on our phones? Does TikTok still work? Uh, does it go dark? Can we still use it? Are VPNs involved? What happens? Well, what's going to happen if the, if the bill is signed, Right. It, you know, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, will have a matter of months to divest uh, this asset of TikTok. And then, you know, there's, there are real question marks as to what exactly happens to the functionality of the app itself. That's really unclear here with this legislation. But if if this all goes through and it's still a big if and ByteDance does bite and divest this asset, well, that's, what's going to be is there are going to be a bunch of suitors who are going to be looking at this company and thinking about buying it. And then in, in my view, it could mean that, that TikTok as, as an app uh, might change hands, but we don't know yet if that's going to mean that it's going to be active throughout that entire process of a sale, potentially down the road. I got it. And so uh, talking about that divesting, we all know about tech companies going for insane, insane amounts of money, but this seems like next level in terms of valuation, right? Could this be one of the most expensive companies ever sold? Well, analysts are putting this at a price tag of potentially $60 billion for TikTok. I mean, that is that is a big price tag uh, for, a, for a social media company that's been under such scrutiny lately. And uh, look, there are going to be a, plenty of people out there, companies, uh, I would imagine individual investors on Wall Street, who are going to be interested in making a move for this company. And, it, it's, and it's, it, again, if we get to that point. Uh, but there's still such a long way to go here. I mean, we, you know, you've got to get, the bill's got to get through the Senate. Uh, I think there's going to be some real hurdles there. But if we get to that point where ByteDance is forced to sell off TikTok, you're looking at something of around $60 billion, at least, according to analysts. And it's going to be really interesting to see who steps in and wants to buy this at that point in time. Is there a short list? I mean, who's got $60 billion just laying around these days? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I mean, I've seen these, these, these questions of whether a Meta would actually want to go buy this. You know, I was speaking to some people uh, over the last 24 hours who have had interest in buying TikTok in years past. Remember, this isn't the first time this has come up in Congress, right, where Congress has talked about some sort of legislation that could lead to a, a similar scenario to this, where TikTok could be banned or, or spun off. So there's been interest, particularly of people I've spoken to on Wall Street, of putting together some sort of package if this gets to the point where it is spun off by ByteDance. But again, it, it's still unclear who, who is going to end up wanting to buy this and how much they're going to be willing to put forward uh, after, after this is all said and done. Sounds like the craziest fire sale ever. Brian Schwartz, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.
In Texas, the search for a missing college student is about to head into its second week with still no sign of 21-year-old Texas A&M student Caleb Harris, who was last seen letting his dog out at 2 in the morning seven days ago. Investigators say he left his wallet, his keys, and car behind before he disappeared. His family is terrified he's been kidnapped. And with the clock ticking, police are teaming up with the Coast Guard to search around Caleb's apartment in Corpus Christi. Here's what Caleb's parents said about the search. I met with them this morning. Uh, we, we did some bloodhound searches. Uh, phenomenal. And that these are the best bloodhounds in the world uh, coming out of our Texas State Justice System. And those guys are absolutely amazing. And the, the Corpus Christi Police is, is like I said, using every asset. I mean, we've had Coast Guard out with their helicopters. We've had everything. NBC's Morgan Chesky has been following this for us and joins us now from Dallas. Uh, Morgan, a ton of people have jumped in to help find Caleb. Any leads tonight? Yeah, Gotti, hundreds of people have volunteered to help search for Caleb Harris, and yet here we are eight days after his disappearance. And one of the most frustrating aspects of all of this is that there has not been one physical piece of evidence that investigators can point to and say that they're getting closer to finding this Texas A&M Corpus Christi student who, as you mentioned, just had walked outside to walk his dog, get an Uber Eats order, and was never seen again. We do know uh, that uh, as of right now, Searchers have not found anything. Corpus Christi police have now partnered with the U.S. Coast Guard. Of course, his apartment, where he was last seen, is in a coastal area, uh, but no sign of that missing college student as of tonight. Gotti? And Morgan, let's rewind just a little bit there. What else do we know about the morning that Caleb went missing, that Uber Eats order and his, his dog being walked? Right. Investigators have been pouring over kind of those final few hours, final few minutes to figure out what, if anything, could have happened. Uh, we do know that he made that Uber Eats order uh, early in the in the morning hours there after 2 a.m. The uh, app said that the order was, in fact, delivered. And Caleb Harris's own sister said that she was communicating him, uh, communicating with him via Snapchat uh, shortly thereafter. And then it was at that point that Pretty much everything went dark. He left behind those possessions uh, and has not been seen since. Uh, and we know that uh, as of right now, uh, parents are cooperating with investigators and they say that he really had just shared nothing that would have uh, given them the impression that he was going through any troubling time. He had been making plans for this upcoming summer to go to Alaska. Uh, and uh, his father, incredibly distraught, as he, you know, saw his son as a very positive, uh, kind of uplifting person, and then to have him disappear like this is even more heartbreaking. Gotti? I imagine. And every hour counts in a search like this. What, what happens next? Uh, that is a great question. We do know that, you know, every day that goes by, uh, odds could potentially be going down to bring him back home. Uh, we know that in addition to, of course, the Coast Guard partnering with Corpus Christi Police, more and more volunteers are joining. Uh, but I want you to hear what Caleb Harris's father had to say in his own words uh, about the state of where things are right now. It's in a, it's it's. At a point where he has, he literally has just vanished, and there's no leads, there's no clues. Um, that's what makes it so difficult because we have no, um, no direction more than anything uh, as far as a place to go, a place to look. Yeah, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, where he is a student, a very tight-knit community, uh, that area on northern Padre Island, it's not a vast area to cover here, Gotti, and I think that only goes to add to the frustration that, as you heard uh, his own father say, not one single piece of evidence has come up as of right now. Gotti? Here's hoping for a miracle. Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. Thank you. And right now, Colorado is getting ready for its turn to see the biggest snowstorm of their season yet. And if snow totals hit double digits, it could be the biggest snowstorm there in years. About 5 million people are under a winter storm warning from a system that will start as rain, then turn to heavy snow overnight, staying that way until Friday. 
Higher elevations could see up to a foot of snow, while areas like Denver could see up to 10 inches. And some airlines are already issuing travel advisories, including Southwest, United, Delta, American, all allowing people to change their travel plans. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is watching all of it. He joins us now. Bill, uh, this storm, it's uh, expected to last through Friday. So what should people expect over the next few days? Very difficult travel in areas that you don't really associate with big Colorado snowstorms. This is not a huge snowstorm for the ski resorts. This isn't like, you know, let's pack my bags and go to Colorado for epic skiing. This is going to be in the front range. This is going up into the mountains, and that includes the Denver area. That's, who, that's who's going to see the incredible snow. So look at this change in Inglewood. This is what Colorado is known for. About three hours ago, it was 52 degrees and rain in Inglewood. Now the temperatures dropped down about into the 30s, and it just changed over to snow. So Denver earlier today was 52. And they're going to go over to snow this evening. So things are quickly going to change. The roads are expected to be slushy by midnight and by morning about six inches on the ground. A lot of schools are already canceling from Boulder into the Denver area. And it's not just the front range. That's who's going to get the worst of this. But even in Wyoming and portions of Utah, northern Arizona and northern New Mexico, we are going to see impacts from this storm. But the really high totals, the crippling heavy snow on the trees that will break limbs, land on power lines and take them down and cause power outages, that is going to be in this area here from just south of Laramie and Cheyenne down just outside of Denver, especially the suburbs just west of Denver southwards. And I want to show you some of the uh, snow predictions. We take all of our computers, we put them in what we call a blended model. So downtown Denver, it looks like at least 12 inches. National Weather Service forecast is now 12 to 18 for downtown Denver. But if you go just west of town, that's where you get the heavy stuff. There's a place called Evergreen, which is located just outside of Castle Rock. The official forecast is 30 to 36 inches of snow by the time we get to Friday. So it's not often you see any snow forecast anywhere in the country that calls for three feet of snow in a populated area. Then also, the severe weather is a problem, too. We haven't seen too many severe storms yet. A couple were south of St. Louis, but a tornado watch is up, includes the Kansas City area. And we'll be watching this as we go through this evening. Isolated storms will continue to pop up, and all the way through about 1 a.m., guys, this will be an overnight event with some of the severe weather. Bill Karens, thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, we are following some big movement tonight on the Trump election interference case in Georgia. Plus, violence is breaking out all over Haiti, and there is one thing that there is no shortage of, guns. We're going to explain why some people there are blaming the U.S. for that. And later this hour, we've got two words for you. Toxic cat. Why people in Japan are on high alert for a kitty who jumped into a vat of toxic chemicals. Sounds like a new superhero origin story, but it's all just ahead, so stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. The Oklahoma State Medical Examiner says the high school student next Benedict died of suicide. The 16-year-old died a day after a fight at their high school. The report listed the probable cause of death as the combination of two drugs. And three men are facing gun charges in the Kansas City Chiefs parade shooting. They're accused of opening fire during the rally last month. Two juveniles were also arrested last month and charged in a Jackson County court. One person was killed in the shooting. The New York City Mayor Eric Adams is defending the NYPD over their handling of an incident where officers used a stun gun on a migrant who was holding a toddler. They responded to reports of an intoxicated man threatening staff members at a migrant shelter on Friday night. Police say the man was warned several times to give the child to another adult, but he refused. Three officers eventually detained him. And two people were killed in Pennsylvania yesterday in this large home explosion. Drone video from our affiliate shows the devastation caused by that blast. And apparently people in the area felt it from miles away. Two adults were found dead at the scene and some homes nearby were also damaged. It's not yet clear what caused the blast, but an investigation is ongoing. We've got another scary moment aboard an Alaska Airlines flight to tell you about. Apparently a student pilot tried getting into the cockpit on a cross-country flight last week. Authorities say he was trying to test crew members in some sort of stunt. He actually tried to open the door three times. He was restrained and is now being mentally evaluated. And in Georgia, some pretty big movement in that election interference case against former President Donald Trump. Earlier today, a Fulton County Superior Court judge dismissed three of the 13 charges against him. Trump is still facing 10 other counts in the case and has pled not guilty to all of them. In a statement to NBC News, his attorney wrote in part, the entire prosecution of President Trump is political, constitutes election interference, and should be dismissed. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has the very latest. 
Well, Gotti, there were a total of six counts that were dismissed, three against the former president, and they all have to do with alleged solicitation of violation of oath of an officer. So to put that in plain terms, what that means for those of us following the case, it basically means that that now infamous phone call that the former president made to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger here in Georgia, telling him to find enough votes to overturn Biden's election victory in Georgia, the count related to that has been dismissed. Now, it's important to note that as the case goes and the evidence of that phone call, that doesn't go away. It's still in the indictment. It'll still be entered into court because it's part of the sweeping RICO charge, but the specific count against it has been dismissed. Now, as to why, the judge basically says that the DA didn't do enough to prove that a crime was committed and that the attorneys didn't have sufficient information to be able to defend their clients. Now, as for the impact this is going to have on the case, in speaking with a number of Georgia attorneys, a couple of Georgia attorneys here, uh, basically they say it's minimal impact. That's because the RICO charge, which really is the meat of this case, that still sticks. Now, of course, we started this week expecting another major decision from the judge, something that we're still waiting on, and that's whether or not D.A. Fannie Willis can stay on this case. You know, for the past two and a half months, we've been uh, hearing a motion to dismiss her based on allegations of financial benefits uh, because of a personal relationship she's having with a special prosecutor. We're still waiting on the judge to decide that, and of course, it is going to have a very large bearing, whichever way he decides on how this case moves forward. Got it. And the wait for that continues. NBC's Blaine Alexander, thanks so much. And it is official, 2020, it's a rematch now. Both President Biden and former President Donald Trump became their party's presumptive non nominees after winning primary contests last night. So we're going to see 2020 all over again. But a lot has changed in the last four years. So what states would need to flip to see a change in the White House? NBC's national political correspondent Steve Kornacki is at the big board to help us figure it out. Hey there, Steve. The rematch is on. It's Trump Biden part two. So let's take our first look at the road to 270. What does the playing field look like at the outset of this campaign? So this is how we ended up in 2020. The Trump states in red, obviously the Biden states in blue. It all added up to 306 electoral votes for Joe Biden and the presidency. And the first thing to know looking at this is that math would be different even if Biden won all the same states he won, and even if Trump won all the same states he won. Why? Because we had the census and we had reapportionment since 2020, and that changes the number of electoral votes in some states. So if you apply the new electoral vote totals from the census, that same combination of states now only gives Biden 303, Trump 235, a net gain of three electoral votes in the Trump states just because of the census and reapportionment. So that's the starting point based on 2020. And then the question is, okay, what's the battleground here? And the obvious battleground would be the five states that Donald Trump carried in 2016, but then Joe Biden flipped and won in 2020. That's Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Arizona, those five states. So if the Trump campaign, obviously, wants to be on offense in these states, needs to flip these states. How many? Well, the math can vary a little bit here, but let's go through the simplest path, at least mathematically, from the Trump standpoint. It would be to take the closest of these five states. States. And the two that were the closest were Georgia, margin in 2020, about 12,000 votes, Arizona, 10,000 vote or so margin. So if, big if here, but just showing you the math, if Trump were able to win Georgia, 251. If he added Arizona to that, 262. Still not enough, even with those two states, to hit 270. Meaning, if he wins back the two closest that he lost in 20, Trump still needs to add one of these three, a Wisconsin, a Michigan, a Pennsylvania, which was the closest in 2020 by a margin of just over 20,000 votes. It was Wisconsin. So you could see if Wisconsin were to join those other two, Trump would just clear 270, and that would then be enough if he didn't lose any other states that he won. And that's the other big question here. You know, are there any states on this map? We're going to find out in the next few months that these campaigns can succeed putting in play that we don't think of as being in play right now. The one the Democrats would like to put in play, we'll see if they can, is North Carolina. North Carolina is a pretty big state, you know, 16 electoral votes. Uh, margin had come down for Trump won at both times, but his margin was reduced in 2020. 
poll this week put Trump up five points in North Carolina. A lot of people think it's a pipe dream for Democrats to win it this year, but they're certainly going to try. And if they were to succeed, just showing you again here, look what that does to the Electoral College math. Now you'd have Trump winning back two states here in the Sun Belt and a Midwestern state, but not having Carolina. Biden would still win in the Electoral College there. Again, that would be flipping a Trump state. So we'll see if the Democrats can succeed in doing that. We'll see if the Republicans can succeed in doing it anywhere. It's only our first look, and there are many Many, many more to come. Steve Kornacki, thanks so much. And a Biden versus Trump rematch that might be set, but there's a Kennedy in the mix as well, looking to shape, shake things up. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running as an independent. He's John F. Kennedy's nephew, an environmental lawyer, and controversially an anti-vaxxer. And his campaign has been getting a lot more attention, especially when his potential picks for vice president include a certain NFL quarterback. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has more. You might remember this ad from last month's Super Bowl. Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. A jingle that worked six decades ago, reworked for a new era of Kennedys. Kennedy, Kennedy. This one, not as a Democrat like his uncle, but an independent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the son of the New York senator and former attorney general, now seeking his own path to the White House. But what does he believe and can he actually win? Neither my uncle nor my father would recognize the version of America that we have today. RFK Jr. first made his name as a climate activist and lawyer in the 80s, before pivoting this century to pushing debunked lies that vaccines cause autism. To be crystal clear, this is not true. Scientists have proven that over and over again. But it hasn't stopped the 70-year-old Kennedy, especially since the COVID pandemic, repeatedly spreading misinformation, like his book, baselessly attacking Dr. Anthony Fauci. I pressed him on COVID and vaccines at a rally in Las Vegas last month. Would you have tried to stop the FDA from approving the, uh, the COVID vaccine? I would have said that they need to do science to show that the vaccine is actually going to avert more problems than it's, uh, that, than it's causing. But if you're president, you have agency uh, I would over make sure that there was good science and that any product, but I also would have allowed people to get access to therapeutics that were actually demonstrated to work, like ivermectin, like hydroxychloroquine. Again, doctors say ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine should not be used to treat COVID. But Kennedy could take advantage of the growing number of Americans who don't seek out vaccines to stop COVID. Just 28% of adults have gotten the latest vaccine, down from 69% when it came out in 2021, according to a new Pew poll. The question is, is there an appetite for him or any third party candidate? A new poll out today shows yes, with RFK pulling in nearly 9% of the vote, more than 20% going to someone who isn't Joe Biden or Donald Trump. But can people see him on the ballot? Right now, not many will. The campaign says it has enough signatures in just four states as they try to get on the ballot in all 50. That hasn't stopped Kennedy from preparing like he will be with a vice presidential announcement set in just two weeks. Names he's floated, New York Jets quarterback and fellow anti-vaxxer Aaron Rodgers. Vaughn Hillier, thanks so much. And coming up, a group of U.S. Marines are now in Haiti to protect the American embassy there. Guad Venegas joins us in a moment with the latest on the violent gangs there taking control of the island. But first, I want to show you this. Okay, take a look. No, this is not a furry convention. This is a member of the Richmond Wildlife Center going the extra mile to care for a young fox there by dressing up like one. It might look a little bit creepy, but they are wearing these costumes to act like a mother fox so that little gal can one day be reintroduced into the wild. They've also got a stuffed animal fox so she can cuddle up with night. Thank you, right? And welcome back. Israeli forces say they took out a key Hamas leader today. We're going to get to that in just a bit. But first, here are some other stories we're following from around the world. A huge explosion at a restaurant in China has killed at least two people and left nearly 30 others hurt. Dashcam video captured the moment it happened this morning in a northern Providence about 50 miles from Beijing. A suspected gas leak appears to be the cause there. And it seems like Russian President Vladimir Putin has been hinting at nuclear war ever since that full-scale invasion of Ukraine two years ago, and today was no different. 
In an interview broadcast on state TV, Putin not only bragged about his nuclear forces being on, quote, constant alert, but claimed Russia has now outpaced the U.S. in developing a new generation of nuclear-capable weapons. And a toxic cat is on the loose in Japan. Yeah, you heard me right, a toxic cat. It seems to have fallen into a vat of chemicals at a plant in the city of Fukuyama earlier this week. That surveillance video right there is capturing the cat scampering away, leaving behind a trail of what appeared to be yellow-brown paw prints. The city remains on high alert, hoping to avoid a, a catastrophe. Officials have no idea where the cat is right now. An environmental team has said that the cat might already be dead, but they're trying to remain positive. So far, so good. And in Japan, the country's Space One rocket blew up just seconds after liftoff today. It happened live on TV. There have been no reports of anyone being hurt, but it was the rocket's inaugural launch. Space One was trying to become the first Japanese private company to put a satellite into orbit. And in Haiti, American boots are on the ground. Today, Marines were deployed to protect the U.S. Embassy there. It sits in the capital of Port-au-Prince, the epicenter of chaos and confusion in Haiti, with gangs now controlling a majority of that city. And in so many of the images coming out of Haiti, one of the most striking things you notice is the mass and arsenal on display, not just from the police or the military, but, but from those gangs that are packing some very heavy weaponry. Haiti's uh, people blaming the U.S. for that problem. The United States will never accept that we unite. This is a game. The Americans are very guilty of what is happening now. The majority of weapons in Haiti come from the United States. And NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas joins us now from Miami. Guad, so much of this power question really comes down to who controls the guns right now in Haiti. Where are all these guns coming from? Uh, Gadi, we had a lot of conversations with members of the community yesterday and today, and they all mentioned the weapons. When we see these images, you know, you see them with these powerful weapons that the gangs have been able to use to gain control of a large part of the capital and other parts of Haiti. I had a conversation with a local official who directly uh, blamed the United States. A lot of people here say that the U.S. could do more to stop the flow of weapons. In fact, uh, there was a report from the United Nations uh, that was shared last year in which uh, that report found, this is published from the Office of Drugs and Crime uh, by the United States Nations, they found that the majority of weapons and ammunition in Haiti come from the United States and in particular from Florida. Here's part of a conversation that I had with a, a local uh, community leader about this problem uh, with the weapons earlier today. Where do these gangs cut these arms from? Right from here. It's a shame where Haitians can, af can afford AK-47, but can't afford a, a, a bowl of rice. Something is wrong. And, and, and I'm more concerned is how do we stop that, pi that pipeline of violence? And of course, that report shared by the United Nations said that it's very difficult. A place like Haiti has over 1,700 kilometers of coastline. A lot of the weapons come through the ocean, but some also come through planes and also the border that they share with the Dominican Republic. You can imagine with the chaos that has been going on throughout the country and the issues with the prime minister since the assassination of the former president, Jovenel Moïse, it's been quite difficult for the police to patrol the borders and to do anything to stop stop some of these weapons from coming in, Gotti. When it comes to peacekeeping, when the gangs are better armed than the police, I mean, we've seen police stations raided, right? How, how does that peacekeeping happen? A completely overpowered Gotti from the reports that we have. Uh, these gangs have been able to attack police stations. They broke into the largest prison. A lot of gang members who were in this prison were able to escape. So what we know now is that the national police in Haiti has been overpowered because of the weapons, but also because of the numbers. Now, through the conversations that I had today with members of the community and uh, a local official here that also represents uh, one of the local nonprofits that helps immigrants, 
All of them told me that the information that they have, some of them that have visited Haiti in the last few years, uh, is that the police there doesn't have the proper weapons and the proper equipment to fight the gangs. Now, we know that the international community led by the United Nations has approved a proposal for a peacekeeping uh, mission of soldiers that would come primarily from Kenya. These officers would come from Kenya, about a thousand of them would be joined by officers from other countries. This is all supported by the United United States. In fact, a lot of the money for that peacekeeping mission uh, would come from the United States. But when I ask some of the community members here, uh, they say that this has happened in the past, peacekeeping operations coming from other countries, and they say that they don't have a lot of faith if that's a decision that's going to be made. But right now, that's what's in the plans, to bring in this peace peacekeeping operation uh, coming from Kenya that would be financed by a lot of countries and hope that they can uh, help the local police to restore security in the country, Gotti. And Guad's, Guad, gangs right now, they're controlling about 80% of the capital, right? And the leader that is being talked about the most is this guy that's nicknamed Barbecue. What do we know about him? So, Gotti, uh, the man known as Barbecue is a former uh, Haitian police officer. So you can imagine how well he understands the way the police operates. And when we hear about what is happening in Haiti, we know that there's this special transitional uh, council that, uh, of nine members. They're going to help decide who the new interim prime minister is going to be. And, and between that prime minister and that council, the future of Haiti will sort of be decided. Uh, they will try to hold elections as soon as possible. Uh, but we haven't heard of any direct uh, conversation with the gangs or how the gangs will react when this decision is made. Uh, and there's, it's a very complex situation. Today, when I spoke with some of the members of the community, um, one of the things that Carl told me, who we saw uh, just minutes ago, uh, was that these gangs have a lot of power and support within the people of Haiti because many of them cannot rely on the government to protect them or to provide basic necessities. Here's part of the conversation we had about the gang leader and the power that the gangs have. Why would the community support a gang leader and not the government? Some of them are scared. Some of them are being taken care by him. They, he makes sure like some of them eat, you know, and stuff like that. So it's a mixed bag of people. They're just trying to survive. So for the new government of Haiti, this will be a great challenge to deal with the gangs because, as we know, they control more than 80 percent of the capital. So however it is that they move forward, uh, the way the gangs react or whatever the gangs choose to do so will determine part of the future of the country. So, again, a very complex situation in Haiti, Gotti. Guad Venegas with some incredibly important reporting there. Guad, thanks so much for joining us. And Israel says it took out a Hamas leader in Lebanon today, a man by the name of Hadi Mustafa. The Israeli military is calling him, quote, a significant operative. Meanwhile, even with the aid now slowly trickling into Gaza, many people there, especially children, appear to be on the brink of famine. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has more. We're finally seeing trucks deliver aid to the Gaza Strip by land through northern Gaza today. Now, Israel has allowed a United Nations shipment of much-needed food aid, meals for about 25,000 people in the Gaza Strip, to the northern part of that enclave. And this is for the first time in three weeks. So the United Nations had mostly suspended their aid deliveries to Gaza, complaining about Israeli restrictions on what aid can get in and out, the poor road conditions inside this enclave that has endured more than five months of war, and the lack of stability in Gaza, where we've seen Palestinians who are desperate for food crowding aid trucks. And Gaza is on the brink of famine, according to the World Food Program, and there have been reports and videos of people eating things like animal feed. And just in the past week, doctors in Gaza reported that premature babies have begun dying of malnutrition, according to the Associated Press. And aid agencies say a big problem with food distribution is Israel's continuing attacks on the Gaza Strip, the war. And just today, the UN Agency of Palestinian Refugees, or UNRWA, they said that a member of its staff was killed and nearly two dozen were injured when Israel bombed a food distribution center. Attacks that UNWAS chief have said are now commonplace. And now the U.S., Britain and the European Union, among others, have said they are working on establishing a facility to deliver aid by sea. And the Biden administration is planning on building a floating pier to take in that aid, but that could take months to set up, even as the prospect looms of a large-scale famine.
NBC's Matt Bradley, thank you so much. And still to come, we are on Verdict Watch as the jury deliberates the case of a Michigan school shooter's father. We already saw his wife convicted, but could he be next? That is coming up straight ahead, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the stories we're following out in the West. LAPD found themselves in an hour-long standoff with a man wielding a chainsaw. Now, this happened yesterday. You can see him being held up by cops in the back of that pickup down there. The man eventually surrendered. Police say he had an outstanding arrest warrant related to domestic violence. And several Los Angeles homes were damaged overnight when a landslide came crashing through. No one was hurt, but at least three people were evacuated. Officials say it's unclear what caused that landslide, but heavy rainstorms like the one we had this winter can definitely trigger slides for months after. And flaming hot Cheetos could be getting banned across California schools. There's a new bill that wants to ban snacks sold in public schools that are full of artificial chemicals, which would include those in flaming hot Cheetos. California lawmakers say those chemicals are harmful to young minds that are still developing. And jury members in Michigan uh, are home tonight for the night, but they'll return to court tomorrow to decide if the father of the Oxford High School sh shooter should be punished for his son's crimes. Today, closing arguments focused on how the gun used in the massacre was stored and whether or not James Crumbly performed his duty as a parent. Here's some of what we heard. You hear him say that there was some doodling on a paper, that he, it was, he was a perfect kid, but here's what he never says. He never says, I don't know how he got it. Never says that. James Crumbly had no idea what his son was capable of. He had no idea what his son was planning. And he had absolutely no idea that his son had access to those firearms. Last month, Crumbly's wife was convicted on the same charges. NBC News correspondent Adrian Bratis has more. Tonight, a jury has started deliberating whether to convict James Crumbly of involuntary manslaughter and make him the first father to be held criminally responsible for a school shooting committed by their child. James Crumbly is not on trial for what his son did. James Crumbly is on trial for what he did and what he didn't do. You heard testimony from over a dozen witnesses. None of them told you that James knew what his son was planning. His wife, Jennifer, found guilty on the same charges last month in her own landmark trial. I mean, it was just, it was chaos. The prosecution calling so, many of the same witnesses yeah, this time around, yes. arguing James Crumbly didn't do enough to stop Ethan from killing four students at Oxford High School in 2021. The most precious in my mind was his smile. He had those braces on for a long time, and he had literally just got them off um, a couple months before. James Crumbly was presented with the easiest, most glaring opportunities to prevent the deaths of these four students, and he did nothing. A key issue, how James Crumbly stored the gun, purchased a few days before the mass shooting. He's Prosecutors reading crazy. excerpts from Ethan's journal, saying in part, quote, I will have to find where my dad hid my 9 millimeter before I can shoot up the school, Ethan wrote, and saying, quote, I have zero help for my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot up the expletive school. Unlike his wife, James Crumbly did not take the stand, and the defense called just one witness, his sister, Karen, who took the stand today. Your nephew never wrote you a note and said, help me. No, sir. And he never drew a picture next to that note with a gun, did he? No. Tonight, after four days of testimony, another landmark case is in the jury's hands. Seeing the evidence and seeing the testimony says enough for itself. And just seeing us there as a present uh, for our children, it, it says enough. Adrian Bratis, thanks so much. And before we go, if you're flying to Miami anytime soon and they ask you to swab your nose when you get off the flight, don't freak out. It's part of this new CDC program, and we're going to tell you all about it when we come back. So stay tuned. And in the future of everything tonight, we are going to bring you the future of health. We're going to see how the CDC is tracking germs from around the world. But first, here's some tech stories we're watching. Spotify, is it the new MTV? Well, Spotify is rolling out music videos on its app in 11 countries, not just here in the United States. Actually, just not here in the United States. Premium users in 11 other countries are going to start watching full music videos hosted directly on Spotify. As part of that beta rollout, only a limited number of videos will be available. 
And in Los Angeles, your next taxi driver might be a robot or might be no one sitting behind the wheel. Waymo One, the self-driving car service owned by Google, is rolling out its robo fleet this Thursday. From Santa Monica to downtown LA, riders on the wait list can call a cab for free during the first weeks of the debut. It's a weird, weird ride. I've been in one and you never forget. And tonight, the future of public health. International travelers arriving at Miami International Airport will soon see some greeters with a bunch of signs. And no, they're not trying to sell you anything, but instead they're trying to encourage people to participate in free anonymous testing to track germs coming from around the globe. Xochitl Hernandez from our Miami station has more. Hi, do you want to help the CDC track viruses and variants? It only takes two minutes to have a big impact. A CDC program called Traveler-Based Genomic Surveillance, or TGS, now officially posted at MIA. With the airport seeing over 21 million travelers a year, it's the portal to the Americas, perfect for genomic sequencing, which tracks how viruses evolve worldwide. Testing has declined, sequencing has declined since the start of the COVID pandemic. And as we uh, move into this new era, we still need to have a vision of what's happening with the virus all over the world so we can be prepared at home. And put that on the lower part of your nose. The nasal swabbing program started during the rise of the Delta variant in September 2021 and has expanded from three airports to eight in an important time where Allison Taylor Walker from the CDC says COVID-19 testing and sequencing has decreased about 90% worldwide. Because we wanted to know what was happening with the virus and also enable science in America to respond to those changes with vaccines, with new recommendations if they were needed. So to help us prepare and protect our communities. It's not meant to tell you if you're COVID positive or negative right then and there and won't track personal information. Walker says so far, other airports have seen high levels of participation with over 475,000 volunteers since 2021. So chill, huh? Hernandez, thanks so very much for that. And finally tonight, it is a very special day here at Stay Tuned Now because it is our streaming TV birthday. It was exactly one year ago today that we brought you our very first show. We set out to tell you all the stories that matter the most in your world and also to have a little fun along the way. So here's a quick look back. We've got to talk about what was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen on Capitol Hill, and that was lawmakers having a very sober conversation about crashed UFO, alien craft, and dead aliens inside the halls of Congress. I can understand that perspective from watching it through television. Honestly, I'm just glad you are covering this, Scotty, because this is news, and your network is covering it because it is news. This is a replica of the VSS Unity that we're going to see launch tomorrow. Check this out. It's coming down on the landing pad over here, about 100 knots. The nose is still up. This right here, this is a landing skid. This is the craziest part for me. Look at this right there. That is actually a skid. And in the case of the VSS Unity, that skid is made out of wood. They're talking to a woman right here that they've already pulled out from the location. And she's telling them that there are two people inside. Uh, but we're still waiting to see what happens. Actually, he's coming out right now with his hands up. Thank you guys so very much for, for joining us. Hopefully you'll play us out here. Why is this happening? What are they saying about what this could look like going forward? Hey. What exactly is the union asking for? I got to ask, sorry to ask this, but what you were saying that they have a great food spread. What do the uncommitted voters eat? Like, is it a big buffet of choices? One galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars and probably hundreds of billions of planets. Wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> let me, let me, I need to process what you're saying. One galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. Of stars. And we're talking about hundreds of billions of galaxies? Yes. So this almost looks like a salad. It's called sambal tuna. Okay. It's a spicy tuna. Okay. Sambal is like an um, Indonesian salsa. Yes, wow. Anything in Whoa! That. I mean, it's wild to think that what you've done, more people have gone to space than walked around the United States. I have no intentions on going to space. <laughs> planet Earth is just fine for you. I love planet Earth. <laughs> the system we have in the ocean right now sweeps an area the size of a football field every 10 seconds. Wow. 
to a segment we are calling the future of everything where we look not only at the latest headlines in tech and science but tell you about emerging technology that could change the way we live so we uploaded a few examples of my own voice and cadence and soon i could type in anything and have it come out sounding freakishly close this is what my voice sounds like when i clone it this is what my voice sounds like when i clone it wow this is the future of drone warfare right here in a lot of ways, yes, there's no person who's flying this thing. It is a totally autonomous system that's capable of flying itself better than any human pilot ever could. They came to our first show to say hi. Can you say hi to me? Hi. Hi. <laughs> and in a world where there is so much difficulty, so much division, we're going to also do our best to try to seek out the stories that bring us closer together. We want to look towards a better future. And, and our future of everything, we are going to keep bringing you the stories uh, that matter the most, hopefully for years to come. Thank you so very much for watching and supporting us this first year. We can't wait to see what you, we've got in store for you in 2024. That's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.